station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, I am ready for the event. Excellent. KFI Radio, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Amy King with KFI's Wake Up Call. How do you hear me? Amy, this is Nick, and I can hear you loud and clear. All right. Oh, my gosh. Nick Haig, Colonel Nick Haig, Space Force Guardian, NASA astronaut, live from the International Space Station. We are thrilled to talk to you this morning. Yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome to be able to connect with you again. I've, I've loved kind of periodically checking with you leading up to getting up here, and, and now I'm here, so floating in space. And I love this because we actually can see you. And just so you know, um, we're going to put this out on our social media and our website and everything after it's done. And I believe it's also on NASA Plus now. But um, Nick, I want to go back just a little bit because the last time we talked, you were doing your final training. And then we were supposed to talk to you as you got closer to launch time. But then everything changed because you all had to make accommodations to bring Sonny and Butch home as they, as we know, they went up in June on the Starliner and weren't able to come back on that. So your mission changed. And during that time, you got a promotion and now you're the commander of your mission. So I'd love to go back to launch day as um, a lot of my friends and I were watching on earth and watching you launch from Cape Canaveral. And I said, hey, our friend Colonel Nick Haig is right there on that rocket. So there's a couple of firsts. You're a mission commander for the first time. Congratulations. You're the first Space Force Guardian to head to the International Space Station. And even the launch location was a first. Can you tell us about that? What was different about this one? Yeah, for, uh, for the first time on Space Launch Complex 40, which is on the, the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station side of the launch complex there at Kennedy Space Center and, and the Space Force side, uh, we launched humans into space, and so we now have that capability from two different launch pads uh, to launch people to the International Space Station uh, using our U.S. providers. Um, but yeah, you point out a lot of interesting, interesting firsts. Uh, I, I think the thing that is is constant in all of that is is change, and and really, you know, life for everybody is full of change and surprise. And I, I you, if you had asked me when we first were talking six months ago. Um, if it was just going to end up being Alex and I launching up here to create room to have Butch and Sonny join our crew and, and do our mission up here, I, I would have never expected to have that happen. Um, but the ability to do that is, is really the strength of our training program and, and the strength of the professional astronaut and cosmonaut corps is, is we adapt to what life throws at us. Yeah, and I remember our, during our earlier conversations, you kept saying we do this plan and then we plan for the things to fail and fall apart so we can come up with contingencies. And it just, on our end, it seems like you guys have taken care of this seamlessly. Um, can, can we go back to the launch for just a second? Do you remember as you're sitting there strapped to a rocket, as you have said, being getting ready to be hurled into space as you're counting down to zero? What goes through your mind and what does it feel like when liftoff starts? It's you, you, when you're sitting there, you're full of all kinds of emotions. And I, I think the emotions have, have gradually changed for me over the course of my launches. The, you know, the first launch, you really don't know what to expect. Um, and so five years ago, that was a lot of adrenaline, a lot of, a lot of anticipation, uh, a lot of nervousness, not wanting to, to make a mistake and, and to be perfect in the moment. Um, as I've progressed, you know, to, this is the third launch now. Um, I think that the difference this time is, is I, I kept thinking about all the people that make it possible. You know, you, you sit there on the launch pad for about two and a half hours before you ever launch, and there's not much to do, so you think a lot. And, and I kept thinking about all the people that make it possible for, for us to do this type of mission. Um, you know, and that's that, you know, the NASA teams that prepare us, uh, the, the SpaceX teams that prepare us, uh, the, the space station program itself, our international partners, there's so many there, but, you know, it was even more special sitting on Launch Complex uh, at 40 there on the, the Space Force Station 
um, because I felt even more connected to that to other part of this gigantic team that makes it possible. And, and that's the, you know, the Space Force guardians around the globe that do some fundamental things that make it possible for us to, to operate up here, like GPS and, and you know, uh, debris avoidance and, and making sure that we stay safe and, and nothing runs into us while we're orbiting the Earth. So it just, it really makes you feel connected. And, and that was the difference this time around. Okay, uh, so let's talk about life on the space station, Colonel Haig. First of all, how many of you are now up there on the space station? I just saw one of your fellow astronauts go uh, floating by behind you. Yeah, so currently right now we have 11 people on the space station and today is kind of a, an exciting day. Uh, crew, crew 8 is preparing to undock, so four of our crewmates are getting ready to hop into their capsule and return to Earth and splash down uh, on Friday. And so there's a, a buzz of, of anticipation and excitement. I'm happy for them to be able to get back to their to their families. Uh, it's also it's also an exciting time because it, it's turning over another chapter, another crew handover. Uh, you know, it, it, they're passing the baton to us, if you will, yeah. and and that baton passing has been happening continuously for two and a half decades. And there floats Matt. Uh, screaming by getting ready to go up into his dragon and continue packing and getting ready to leave. I love that. Yeah. And that be, brings us back to where you were planning for contingencies because we got a note from NASA yesterday, even saying, Hey, we're set to go, but things might change because crew eight is getting ready to head home. And so we might have to delay, but luckily we didn't have to, when we get to talk to you today. So um, I want to ask you some like uh, silly things. One, what time is it on the space station? So we use uh, Greenwich Mean Time, so it's currently 12.42. Okay. And um, we were wondering about, like, oxygen and water, because we know that you have to have resupply missions to bring you food and supplies and stuff. Do they have to bring air up there? Do you <laughs> – somebody just went over your head. Do you have to recycle air? Do you recycle water? How does that work? Yeah, so we it, it's a it's a fairly closed loop system, meaning we have to recycle everything. And currently, if you if we focus on water, the station is operating about 98 percent of of the ability to recycle the water that we use. And so even right now, there's air conditioners that are scrubbing this air, and and as we perspire uh, moisture, they're condensing that, putting it back into a system that purifies it so we can drink it. And so we're able to recover 98 percent of the water that we consume, which is important because because water is really dense, it's really heavy, and things that are heavy are expensive to launch. Uh, it'll be even more important when we start having a, a sustained presence on, on the moon to be able to recycle without having to resupply and use our, our resources that are in place already. So you kind of have an endless supply now that it's there. It, it, it's it's pretty endless, but we still rely on on cargo vehicles every month or two to bring up some supplies to, to resupply us. One of the things that, that we are working on, but we haven't figured out yet, is how do we grow all the food that we need so that we don't have to resupply with food? Currently, we resupply all of our food from the ground. And so we rely on those transport vehicles to bring us up food every couple months to make sure we've got enough to eat. Yeah. Okay. So is that some of the experiments that you're working on is growing things on the space station? Absolutely. You know, while I'm up here, we're, we're going to conduct roughly 200 different experiments and, and uh, several of those are focused on how do we grow things in space? How do we grow leafy greens uh, that, are, that are fairly easy to grow without having to it, grow and consume without having to to uh, process them too much. Uh, we're in the infancy of figuring out how to do that in space. And it's gonna be critical going forward that we figure out how to do that in mass. So it's not quite like Matt Damon on Mars just yet, but you're getting there. Uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking to Space Force Guardian, Colonel Nick Haig, live on the International Space Station. And Colonel Haig, I wanted to ask you a, qu a couple of questions about living together on the space station, because you said there's 11 of you, a couple are going home very quickly, but do you guys just kind of grab and go or like for meals, do you sit down and have dinners together? How does that work? 
So our, our work day is is roughly 7:30 in the morning till 7:30 in the evening. Uh, before the workday starts and after the workday starts are when we have breakfast and dinner. And those meals tend to be more communal. Uh, we all will gather around in the galley. You can see in the back behind me, there's a table back there. That's where our food warmer's at. That's where our little refrigerators are at. Uh, so we'd gather in there and, and, and just enjoy each other's company while we have breakfast and dinner. Uh, lunch can be a little hit and miss because the day is pretty regimented up here and everybody is has a, a list of assigned activities and we're trying to get them all done. And so lunch basically is, is a grab and go uh, yeah. type mentality. Okay. And is there, let's be honest, is the food good on the space station or is it uh, not so great? Yeah, the food is great up here. It's, uh, there's plenty of it. And, uh, and there's a variety of, of, of flavors. You know, this morning I, I was able to have some coffee with cream and sugar. I had some citrus fruit salad, some strawberries, uh, oatmeal with blueberries in it, and a, and a vegetable quiche. That's what I had this morning. It's delicious. No complaints. <laughs> Sounds better than the breakfast that I'm having. Okay, so uh, we had talked earlier that you had been training for spacewalks and you were doing it in that big old pool and it was very much like uh, life in space, except for the bubbles that you see in the pool. Have you had a chance to go on a spacewalk since you got to the space station? So far, no, no spacewalks. Uh, okay. We are planning to do a couple spacewalks later in our expedition. Okay. Uh, the, the timing of those depends on a lot of different factors. You were talking about how we might have to adjust real time today just for the undocking of, of Crew 8. There are a series of major events between now and when we would do the spacewalks that will drive the final timing. But I, I look forward to going out the hatch when the opportunity presents itself. And here's another question for you, Colonel Haig. Does everybody get to do a spacewalk or do you guys have to do like rock, paper, scissors to see who gets to go out? Yeah, it's more like rock, paper, scissors. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> there's not uh, enough spacewalk. I wish, I wish everybody could go out and, and experience a spacewalk. Sometimes there's an expedition where there's no work that needs to be done on the outside. Um, spacewalks are a, a dangerous activity, a risky activity that we take. And so we only go out when we have to. And so the things that compel us to go out there are to fix things that, that are broken to kind of maintain the, our laboratory. Uh, the other things we go out to do are, are put science in place or to repair science experiments or increase the capabilities of the station. So we don't go out all the time, but when we do, we sure try to enjoy it. All right. Again, if you're just joining us, we're talking to Space Force Guardian Colonel Nick Haig, who is also a NASA astronaut, just happens to be buzzing around the Earth at about 17,000 miles an hour on the International Space Station. Colonel Haig, how many sunrises and sunsets do you get in a day? Roughly 16. So about every 45 minutes, if you float over to the cupola windows, you're going to see a sunrise or a sunset. And what's your, so far you've been up there for a few weeks now, what's your favorite thing about being on the International Space Station? There's a lot of things that you that you really enjoy, so it's tough for me to say this is my favorite thing. Uh, <laughs> going over and watching the Earth glide by is is unbelievable. In, in 10 minutes, we can go all the way from Washington State all the way down to the tip of the you know the Florida Peninsula and, and Key West and see the entire U.S. glide by, and you can look down with your naked eye and you can see the city city roads and buildings and, and it feels so close even though you know you're 250 miles away uh, that's it's just it's awe-inspiring to have that perspective but you know when you come back inside it's you know it's it's fun to be able to do tricks and and flips and be upside <laughs> down and and, and con right continue down. to talk and 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 so it, that never gets old we have our own little uh, competition of you know, who can do as many flips without uh, wrecking into something or, or transit the, uh, the lab in the most dynamic way. But I think the, the singular most favorite thing I like doing up here is doing things with, with other humans. 
you know, that shared experience of whether we're, we're competing and doing zero-G gymnastics or whether we're both looking out the window, that shared experience makes it even more special. Okay, then another quick question, and we're running out of time, so i got to try to get a couple in there, but you were just doing some flips, and, and we were talking, and I've been thinking about zero gravity, and I was like, well, what does it feel like if you're upside down in space? Do you even know if you're upside down? If I close my eyes and I flip upside down, I can't tell I'm upside down. So the only way we can decide which way is up and which way is down is, is visually. And for the most part, it really doesn't make any difference inside the station. We use every surface. So this lab is covered with wires and it's covered with, Sunny just passed underneath me, it's covered with with uh, with experiments on each side and, and computers and cameras and and so we tend to not touch anything, uh, just yeah. these blue handrails uh, that I end up grabbing on. So it's uh, up down makes no difference. Well, you are up there, and we are so excited to be able to talk to you, Colonel Nick Haig. We know you got to go because you got experiments to do, and uh, you got to help some people pack to get home. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you on the International Space Station. Parting words? Yeah, Amy, I just want to say thank you for, for you know, talking with me over the past six to, I think, eight, almost eight months now and, and helping me share this experience. The space flight and the human exploration of space is so important. Uh, it's so life-changing. And, and I anybody that has the the dream of getting involved with it. I urge them to just chase that passion. Uh, there is room for everyone as we explore deeper into space. Thank you again, Colonel Nick Haig, live from the International Space Station. Ooh, and we did it just when we were supposed to. We had at 5.52 and it's 5.52 and he is off and doing his thing. Wow, what a treat. And uh, you know, we have talked to him a few times and in fact, if you Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all participants with KFI Radio Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.